rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. All right. Welcome back, one and all, to Rebel Force Radio. The weekly podcast, not to be confused with the Bad Batch After Show, which we're fully engaged in here each and every week. While the Bad Batch wraps up its three-season run on Disney+, Plus, and we're having a blast with that, by the way, so make sure you're tuning in. Uh, we'd love to have you live if you can... Uh, Make the time, make the date and time. We're just about each and every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. We got a great chat that is there with us every week and just constantly coming up with great questions, observations, theories. We've had some wild theories the last couple of weeks, and that's the fun of it. That is the fun of it. So hopefully you can join us for that. If you can't live, it's also always available for you on the Rebel Force Radio feed. But this is the weekly podcast, the flagship show. Been going strong for Rebel Force Radio for 11 years now. So, so great to be with you. Glad you're hanging out with us. And I'm always glad to be hanging out with this guy, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. Yeah, RFR has been around for 11 years. Holy smokes. But our Star Wars podcasting career goes back to 2006. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, chew on that for a while. <laughs> and uh, if while you're chewing on it, you might want to wash it down with something. I got something for you. You know, a lot of people are looking forward to May the 4th for May the 4th Be With You, RFR Live in Bristol. A lot of people are looking forward to June 4th for the launch, the debut of The Acolyte. But I'm looking forward to April 17th. Star Wars True Blue Milk by Dairy Farmers of America will be available in stores everywhere. Have you heard about this, Swank? What? No, 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 no. Who's making this now? Dairy Farmers of America. Okay. This delicious vanilla-flavored milk is available on April 17th. The Star Wars Galaxy's favorite beverage comes home. It's Blue Milk. And it's got a really cool label with Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader uh, having their saber duel and from Empire Strikes Back. So happy to see Blue Milk being uh, marketed with original trilogy imagery. And uh, this is very exciting. I mean, this was uh, really had the uh, whole McInerney house come to a complete <laughs> stop in the middle of uh, our day uh, as soon as this announcement was made. Um, yeah, everyone just came to a screeching halt. Uh, Star Wars Blue Milk, inspired by Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So, Galaxy's Edge. Oh, at that it's Galaxy's park, yeah. Edge has got its hooks in this. Can well, it just yeah, be but, Star Wars? I mean, that's Wars? just in the fine print. That's just in the fine print. It's inspired by Star Wars, period. All right. But, All right. you know, Galaxy's Edge is a place, you know, it might be, it might be something similar to the, uh, the flavor or the recipe. It's more than just uh, food coloring added to uh, cow's juice. It's uh, <laughs> poor so, the power of protein. Oh, I like the sound of that. <laughs> Get fueled up. I love with it. Star when does Wars this come out? April, April 17th. Oh, oh, nearly weeks away, less than a month away, Jason. And we will have blue milk mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> As I we can chug hear Steve directly Sansweet from the car. Emptying out all the refrigerators now at Rancho <laughs> Obi Wan, getting ready for his shipment of True Moo's blue milk. That's pretty cool. Ah, there's so yeah. much to look forward to. As you said, uh, we've got the blue milk. We've also got the uh, the re release of The Phantom Menace coming up. Yes. And in, in, in some markets, according to StarWars.com, we're going to be getting all nine films, this big butt numathon that's going to be going on. Can you imagine <laughs> sitting through all nine movies? Oh, um, yeah. The only thing that would f cause me to do it would be 
of course, Star Wars. I don't think I could sit through nine Bond films. I don't think I could sit through nine Star Trek films, but I could sit through, if I had to, nine Star Wars films, all nine of them. Boy, that's a tall order, man. That is a tall order to sit there in a theater. I mean, you'll be in the theater for pretty much a full 24 hours or close yeah. to it. Close yeah. to it. Imagine so, being the cleanup crew after that. Imagine coming in with your little broom and your little pan and ugh, you need, I live that. You need life. more than that. that. You need a fire hose. <laughs> if I was in there, I I would leave behind a definite Call hazmat. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There, there I would leave a chemical footprint of some sort <laughs> in the theater that would probably be highly flammable too. So you probably definitely have to wear the hazmat gear and oh know, they, man. They, They'd have to get that special foam that they use to put out uh, really bad fires. Uh, that's what I would leave behind. But uh, we're not going to leave anything behind this week on no. RFR. It's been a busy week of Star Wars and uh, really uh, all capped off by the new trailer for The Acolyte. But there's a lot of interesting news. Uh, Rogue Squadron, not dead yet. Um, there was a big uh, Anthony Daniels prop auction that happened in L.A. And F.J. DeSanto was there. So he's going to give us a full report. We'll be talking about that along with more from Billy D. Williams' book. Hello, what have we here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of great. stuff this week. A yeah. lot of stuff coming up on the show. All right. Well, let's uh, kick it all off with a little listener mail. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. Chat, chat, gentlemen. This is Kurt from Redding, California. I have a theory about Crosshair's hand thing, and Jimmy said that no theory stone would be left unturned on RFR, so here's my take. I was of the mind that Hemlock became jealous of Crosshair's elite sniper skills and had their hands surgically switched. This would explain where Crosshair was not able to shoot, and also Hemlock constantly rubbing his hand as well. However, I think the truth is actually much darker than that. In the light of recent events, it has become completely obvious to me that while on Pantus, Crosshair clearly sustained frostbite injuries on his shooting hand. And sadly, I think he did this coping with his depression by reaching too many times in the ice chest for a set of his dog, please! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> this is theory. Oh, right, bar number one. We you just got, got Cerveza us. Crystal. You got us. <laughs> I was locked in. I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> really. The, Jimmy thought entire... you were really laying on some serious theories here for us. Oh, my entire <laughs> essence was surrounding your analysis of the Bad Batch. And, and all of a sudden, we got punked. <laughs> we got punked on our own show. Cerveza Crystal. Well. That's good. I hope you're happy with yourself <laughs> and you're proud of yourself. I think so I think we need a do over. I, I think we need. Let, let's give it one. Let's give the mailbag one more shot. Okay. Here All right. Yeah. To redeem it this we can't week. Go we can't out end on like that. <laughs> Chut, up, boys. What's up, Jason and Jimmy? Hey, this is Trevor from Nevada, and I don't know. Just wanted to call in and just give a huge appreciation to you guys. Um, that's it can't express how much I love Rebel Force Radio. It's like uh, almost 9 o'clock here where I am at night, and I had to pop over to the store for some stuff so my wife could make some cookies. Yay me. Uh, and uh, you guys popped on on my, on my phone, and it just felt like a warm, cozy blanket in this uh, cold, windy night. And I just you guys do so much to keep our fandoms alive, and um, you help us to stay excited and Stay in the know and, and all that stuff. And um, just, yeah, huge shout out to you guys. Love you guys so much. Uh, can't wait to meet you guys someday. And uh, may the force be with you. Talk to you later. Bye. Trevor, that was really nice. Thank you for taking the time. I'm, I'm honored for you to consider us like a warm blanket uh, as you're uh, sitting there in the parking lot. No, I, you know, I love comfort food. I love movies. TV shows and podcasts that give me that little that little bit of comfort, you know, after a bad day or a rough uh, rough commute and with the traffic, and so to actually to be able to be that for somebody else because I know how much I appreciate it on the other end. 
uh, it's uh, it's an honor. So thanks yeah. for taking the time to let us know. Absolutely. And for Trevor, his comfort food is the batch of awesome cookies his wife is <laughs> whipping up for him. And aren't those always the easiest store runs to make for your wife? Oh, when yeah. It's for cookie fixings. <laughs> Very nice. You can see that uh, uh, my wife, Wendy, she whipped up some Baby Yoda cookies. And there's a video of that. That's right. Uh, incredible moment on uh, our YouTube channel. And uh, it's really cool how she made the cookies. She took an angel mold that you would use to to cut your 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 cookie dough, and and she flattened the head of the angel, so it it looked like the angel head was the wings were Baby Yoda's ears. It, it was really amazing how she did it. So I'm looking uh, it up, but I, I do remember Jim when you held the cookie up to your mouth the first time you asked. Are you an angel? <laughs> and I was talking to Wendy. You got that right. So here, I got cookies. it right here. This, these are the the uh, amazing Baby Yoda cookies. You can watch the full video there at rebelforceradio.com. There's so much content on rebelforceradio.com. But I tell you what, this little search bar, man, is it powerful. I'm always able to find what I want. And we use it for you know show prep and research. So by all, all means, use that search bar. On yeah. uh, the Rebel Force Radio site, Jim does a great job of putting tags and keywords and things into the show description. So it's a it's a resource for us as well. Yes, and for Baby Yoda cookies. Yeah, so for sure. Thank you, uh, Trevor. We really appreciate it. Rebel Force Radio, baby! Get full access to RFR only on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. You may fire when ready. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. All right, let's do it. It's time for the news. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. All right, the word on every Star Wars fan's lips this week is... The Acolyte. Acolyte. We got the first trailer... Uh, this is the first official trailer. There was footage that was shown at Star Wars Celebration, and there's a lot of shaky iPhone videos. But as far as a legit first look, and uh, Jim, this is being called official trailer, so it's not being called a sneak peek. It's not being called a teaser like we've had in in with releases in the past. They're calling this that. That, that doesn't mean that that's it. They, they can have obviously they can have multiple trailers, a lot of TV spots. They'll have previews and a lot of social media reels and things like that. But when you put official trailer in front mm -hmm. of a piece, you go, okay, this is, you're, you're making a big statement here with this. And this is to give me a sense of what to expect with either the film or in this case, the TV show. Mom always said trailer is as trailer does. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this trailer does at least give us a taste of, of a little bit of what the tone and vibe of this series is going to be. So I think it might be a good idea for us to do one of our famous uh, scene-by-scene, frame-by-frame breakdowns of all the action happening in the trailer itself and uh, provide whatever kind of analysis we can with this brief taste of the upcoming next Star Wars live-action series, The Acolyte. It starts off with a bunch of kids sitting in what we presume is the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Mm -hmm. It has that sort of room aesthetic to it, you know. Uh, no furniture, uh, just a bunch of mats to sit on. The room is circular because that's the, the circle of life. And we're sitting crisscross applesauce, as the kids call yes, it. Yes, indeedy. <laughs> yes, we are. Well, most of us. Well, I don't think I, I that think some dude species, can. I don't think he can make yeah. it quite. So, some species have a little, <laughs> little difficulty uh, working that out, but uh, you know they do the best they can. So. Right. All right. Let's. You ready uh, to roll it? Let, yeah, let's roll it and right. uh, see what happens. Here. All right. Here we go. Close your eyes. And I'll kiss you tomorrow. I'll miss you. Your eyes <laughs> can deceive All the younglings you. here. As the Jedi Master is talking to them. We must not trust them. 
and a uh, purple. Let's take a look at this here. So this is, you know, if you if you if you look at the difference, the contrast, and of course in the Jedi topes and all of the beiges, not a whole lot of color here, and then boom, they hit you with this uh, dark purple uh, robed figure i'm assuming it's a female very slight frame here oh so that's obviously amanda sternberg am, am i saying her name correctly I, I should get my notes out in front of me mm. um yeah amanda stenberg mm -hmm. that's her character may the assassin may the assassin yeah and that's that's a that's a real name for an assassin may that really sends shivers down my spine to hear May is hunting me down. It's like, what what made them hold back? Why didn't they just call her like Daisy May or something? You know, make her make it real homey well, for us. Maybe it's like Grace Jones in uh, A View to a Kill. Maybe it's May Day. May, May Day. Day. Now that's a name that strikes fear, but just May May. Or maybe she's um, May the Fourth. <laughs> They're already marketing. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? <laughs> the show comes out June the fourth. You guys missed it by a whole month. Oh, but well, yeah, that's yeah. this is her character, the assassin May. Okay. Going through one of those kind of typical Star Wars uh, marketplaces out on the street. Have, it looks have we like populated. Have have yeah. we populated? One thing I noticed about season three of The Mandalorian. When they were hanging out, like in the town square in um, Navarro, and the pirates were raiding and people were running for their lives, it didn't feel very populated to me. Dude, it, it like seems just, like the whole town had about 11 people. Yeah. And we kept just, seeing the same people over and over. Right, running by the camera. <laughs> right. But I mean, this one, it, it seems there's definitely a lot more people. It has more of that Rogue One vibe. Yes. When Jin and Cassian were walking through the marketplace on Jetta, Jetta City. And um, that's uh, it's more of the vibes I'm getting from this. Obviously, a big difference between this and The Mandalorian, too, is none of this was shot on the volume. Mm. It's all shot on location with practical sets in England. When I say on location, I mean, like, in a real place, you know. Right, real right, atmosphere. right. atmosphere. I'm sure a lot of this was shot on sound stages and whatnot, but um, they are actually within practical sets. Yes. All right. Tell me what comes into your mind. And this looks like a, maybe a cantina or a restaurant here. Yeah, it's looks a like canteen. someone's eating salad. It's <laughs> someone having a salad. Yeah, That's someone is having like a me. salad. <laughs> you can even see the croutons. <laughs> this will be showing up at Galaxy's Edge here in a couple months. Yeah. You yeah. can get the well, acolyte salad, salad, and salad dressing. <laughs> It'll be you know like instead of Paul Newman's, you'll be getting uh, Kyle Newman's. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, there's some restaurant or canteen or something. Life. Balance. I see fire. Fire. And there's Carrie Ann Moss. There from she the is. Matrix. So a so lot of fans are very excited about her presence in this show. At least the way this is cut, of course, you know they can do so much with trailers. It would you would assume that May is rendezvousing with uh, Carrie Moss's character. I yeah, maybe. Think maybe. maybe she plays because she's Carrie walking. Moss, she she's plays walking. a Jedi named Master Indara. That's Carrie Ann Moss. Right. So here Master you got Indara. the back of May, and I think Carrie Ann Moss is there in the in the background, right there. If you can kind of see her, she's up against the wall, right under the light to the left. Yeah, she's talking to someone. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, boom. Yeah, I think that is the same scene. Some hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right. And it looks like it's even happening in the same yeah. locale. Right. The, the, the texture on the walls looks similar and the lighting looks similar. So, yeah. You see Carrie Ann Moss and she's clearly, clearly wearing Jedi robes. Hand-to-hand -hand combat with the assassin May. May is wearing a mask. She apparently has, uh, you know, hang-ups from COVID still. And 
<laughs> she's <laughs> look at that. Right oh my gosh, you're right. It does look like a like one of those uh, those tight masks. <laughs> yeah, she's she's she has um, you know low immunity, um, and uh, so and and knives. She's she's got the knives dressed in purple. Her hair is purple. A much yeah. different look than yeah. what I thought we would be getting from the actress. Amanda Stenberg in this show because she presents herself so differently in real life. I mean, obviously she's acting here, so but it's it's kind of a striking look. It, it doesn't look anything really like she does in real life. Granted, there is that mask over her face. But yeah, I find the hair to be really striking. Someone is killing Jedi. All right, let's back that up a little kids. bit. And the yellow, is that a yellow blade? Yellow, orange blade? He says someone is killing Jedi and... And she's stabbing at someone. Stabbing at somebody, but I don't see a... It, yeah, it looks like it's just a, a, a knife or a, a little dagger or something. Yeah, Stabbing at a, someone in white robes. And that's, that looks to be May again. Yeah, that's May again. Yeah. With the mask mm -hmm. and the... Yeah. Uh, and then they're cutting and then here come the, the kids. And yeah, Jim, you're right. That is that is a yellow saber for sure. Yeah, first time we ever saw that was uh, Ray at the end of Rise of Skywalker. So that's not a thing. Sense. And uh, by the way, and I, I can bring this up uh, after this, if unless Jim, on your notes, you have some of these character names. A lot of these character names have emerged because of the uh, Hasbro presentation that went on earlier this week where a lot of these action figures in the Black Series and in the Vintage Collection were announced, and so we got some of the, some of the names. Yes, yes. I, I don't have them all in front of me, but uh, he's definitely a Jedi of some sort. For sure. All right, and then we see... Okay, so it looks like maybe some devastation here, like aftermath of a, of a big bomb or an explosion or something as they're looking out. Uh, it, may, it may be something that... Maybe. Maybe or just that's morning fog. You know? could be morning fog. It looks like I they're get the going into fog. a. F <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a bunch of Jedi, about eight of mm -hmm. them. It looks like they're about ready to go into uh, what looks to be a very sinister forest, and uh, we'll see what kind of uh, wackiness happens to them there. Oh, well, and here's, here's our my favorite. <laughs> this is the Wookiee Jedi. Yeah, can't remember. Yes. Can't remember his name. I can't I see Lobaka, but that's... <laughs> Did you say Lobaka? <laughs> Lobaka was a character from the Expanded Universe in the um, oh. in the Young Jedi Knights novels with uh, Jason and Jaina Solo. Lobaka, and, uh, get out, yeah, really? They hung out, yeah, they hung out with Lobaka. <laughs> it was, it was, was there a high Baka? <laughs> uh, I'm sure. I mean, you know, the, they love that Baka name, those Wookiees, don't they? I bet Harrison Ford would have loved to hang out with Hibaka. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, here we got the, uh, the Wookiee Jedi. Lee Young Jae plays Master Soul. And, yes, he is the Jedi we see in the, At the opening beginning. sequence ah, okay. talking to the young the younglings. And uh, he's, he's, he's gesturing at a guy who I can tell in these few frames is 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 clearly overacting. Uh, he's <laughs> he's chewing scenery, this guy. You know, but it looks like he's the Jedi mind trick is at play here right now. Yeah. This guy is uh, spitting some details about something maybe he doesn't want to reveal, or he's just so overwhelmed by the influence of the Force that he is. Uh, looks like he's about ready to poop his pants. <laughs> yeah. He's got kind of a furry coat on too. It reminds me of. Uh... That, kind of that furry outfit that the original Jabba actor was wearing. Ah, uh, Han, my boy. Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. him. Yeah, kind of like that furry acorn look. What happened? Uh, I sensed the darkness. All right. Uh, I don't know. I was going to back up and take a look at this ship. Yeah, I don't know that we've... I mean, we're not going to have seen any of this stuff. I guess if you're into the High Republic and maybe some of this stuff is going to be Easter eggs from the oh, comics. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this probably has a, a whole different meaning to you folks. According to comments Leslie Headland has made that the show is riddled with 
Easter eggs for not only the High Republic, but the expanded universe, uh, uh, Return of the Jedi, uh, even mm. particular Clone Wars episodes. There'll be uh, something to note of consistency uh, between those, you know, making really nice Easter eggs. So we'll see how that go. all plays out. It's a nice but, payoff yeah. for the High Republic fans. You got to say, you know, that have been sticking with the books and sticking with the comics. I think so, but I don't think you have to be steeped in that story to jump on board with the Acolyte at the beginning. I don't think. Well, they did say that about Ahsoka, too. And we kind of found that to be. Yes, Ahsoka was 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 mired in Star Wars Rebels Mm -hmm. and uh, even a little bit of the Clone Wars. So much so that I really think of Ahsoka as Rebel Season 5. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So I just wonder if what they define, the creators define, is there being learning or catch-up that's necessary versus what we define as, as being necessary. Um, mm. we'll I, see. I, I think, we'll find out. I think this story will stand alone mm. and on its own two feet. Okay. It's the darkness. Boy, May is getting a lot of action in this trailer, man. They are really, uh, as they say in the pro wrestling biz, they're really trying to put her over. Yes. yes. We're seeing a lot of martial arts stuff going mm-hmm. on here. Wire work, which I'm not particularly fond of. You know, crouching tiger, hidden dragon, the Matrix. And it's back up. It's here, all been done characters. before. Yeah, just not in Star Wars. Um, I do really dig the the notion of being able to hang out with Jedi Council members and the Jedi Temple. I like that idea that we're going to be able to spend some time in the, some of those some of those locations. You're bringing uh, up High Republic. This character that you freeze framed on here is a Jedi named Vernestra Rowe, and she's played by Rebecca Henderson. Her character, Vernestra, was a teenager during the events of the High Republic. And this is like a hundred years later. So ah, she a- okay. So, uh, so a pretty big gap between the mm-hmm. furthest publishing, uh, the, the, the publishing timeline, and then what we're getting here. Clearly. So we, yes. Okay. Clearly. Okay. Gotcha. All right. We got another dude here um, noticing, you know, all of the control panels and pads and doodads and greeblies looking very Star Wars. These little details that you see, like on the side of the door here. That character, his name is Kimmer. Kimmer. Q I M I R. Maybe Kimmer. 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 It could be Kimmer or Kimmer. He's a former smuggler and traitor. Oh. And he's played by Manny Jacinto. Mm-hmm. I'm noticing a very young cast here so far, for the most part, with with a couple of exceptions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Carrie Ann Moss is a little older. Uh, the uh, Master Soul actor, who is um, from uh, the Squid Game series. Oh, Lee that's Young right. Jay. Yeah. Lee Young Jay. Those guys are a little bit older. Yeah, but everyone else, I mean, has seemed... And, and I don't know if they're major players in the show, but that whole group of Jedi that we saw, a lot of them looked pretty darn young. This guy looks real young. Yes. More, a bunch more of young Jedi. Jedi. And the Wookiee Jedi's name is Kel Naka. Kel, Kel Naka. Naka. All right. Kel Naka. And then you have some younger folk Hanging around, I believe one of them is a Jedi Knight named Yord Fondar, or Yord Fandar. He is a, a Jedi Temple Guardian. Um, you have mm-hmm. Jackie Lon. Is she there? With the Jackie floor? Lon? <laughs> Jackie Lon. She's oh, a Jackie. Padawan. Okay. I thought you said, I was like, well, that's a, a little Jackie. on the nose, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Jackie. Um, <laughs> Jackie Lon. <laughs> And then okay. some other younger characters who may or may not have action figures on the way. <laughs> A darkness rises. So more of the Carrie Ann Moss versus May fight. Do we have yes. Carrie? What, what's Carrie Ann Moss's character name? Do you have that happen? Master that? Indara. Master Indara. Oh. Indara. Yes. Jim, I'm going to have to have these tattooed on my forehead. 
when we start our after <laughs> You'll shows. pick up on it pretty yeah, fast, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. She's referred to as the protector of the peace. Uh-huh. The That's a, a great Jedi master of physical and mental skill. That's oh, here's this dagger, by the way, that we were, she was coming after the, the Jedi in the white robes. Mm-hmm. And it looks like Carrie Ann Moss's character, Master Indar. Doing is, that classic Jedi move where they hold the hand up. Yeah. You know, like every picture of Ashley Eckstein with a fan, they're always doing that, <laughs> holding right. the hand up. It always looks like to me they're saying, stop, 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 <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I guess it's a force push of some sort. Oh, now okay. she looks important. Oh, she's she's very important. Um, she's so important. Her name is um, Mother Anisea, a leader of a coven of witches. Oh. Not necessarily one of those night sisters, but she is a witch, and she is a leader of these other witches who really value their independence, and they're really keen on preserving their history and... Uh, that's really all I got on them. Inspired by Night Sisters, maybe, but not a Night Sister. Okay. Per se. Now I'm looking at I'm looking at I can't help but I'm trying to make a connection here, and maybe I need to stop doing this. Mm. But after The Rise of Skywalker came out, the 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 that that the all the people that were trying to bring Palpatine back on Exegol. They yes. were called acolytes. Yes. Acolytes. And then ever yes. since that, and then with the announcement of this series, The Acolyte, I started thinking maybe there's some sort of connection with whatever this tribe or this group or this religion or you know whatever it is between what they're going to be talking about here and those people that were on Exegol. I wonder first, will, will Exegol as a planet or a system feature in this at all. Mm. And these people behind this witch, they kind of look like they're decked out a little bit, like the, the acolytes that you saw in the crowd Mm -hmm. in the rise of Skywalker that were all chanting for Palpatine. Yes. Yes. I wonder if they can do the coordinated chanting as well as those folks on Exegol. I was really impressed by that. It was like, you know, being at the most well-rehearsed soccer match of all well, time. You know? I was wondering what that <laughs> rehearsal might have been like, you know? Like, no, 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 no. Chant yes. like you mean it. All right, let's hear from the left. Let's hear <laughs> from the right. <laughs> you in the back. Come on, altos. We need more alto. <laughs> let's hear the girls. Now the guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, where's a Family Guy uh, parody yeah. when you need one? That's just you had right no idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, you knew he was evil, you knew he was twisted, and you knew he was fueled by the dark side. But did you know he was a top-notch entertainer once you hit that stage? <laughs> all right, well, let's you know, do all a those tin pot. Now. All the great dictators throughout world history always had a little bit of the drama, you know, they, oh, that they yeah. could bring with them. So I'm sure Palpatine is, is no different. He recognizes the importance of the theatrics mm-hmm. behind the role and the position. I mean, the he does costume play alone. to the crowd a little. Though. He plays <laughs> to the crowd. Right. You know, that's that's what really made him the uh, the supreme <laughs> Sith. Is, oh. is he knew how to work it. <laughs> Well, it looks like this uh, witch here is uh, working it, and she is this isn't a very good or bad. She's played by Jodie Turner Smith. She plays Mother Anasea. Mother Anasea. Okay. Yes. And then here's more May. Looks like this looks like maybe May running. Oh, maybe not. The hair's maybe a little too short. But someone's running yeah. with uh, fire. Okay, Jim. We just mm-hmm. saw uh, a few minutes ago. What I said was looked like maybe a uh, an explosion or something that happened in a forest. Oh, and now we're seeing yeah. a forest ablaze, so maybe it was a fire of some sort. Right, and then that's the morning after. Now it does not appear. Fire. It does not appear she's wearing Jedi robes. So, I'm thinking that could be May. Maybe it is May. I think it is. Okay, 
And also remember at the very beginning of the trailer, when Master Soul was asking all those younglings about their feelings or what they could see when they closed their eyes. And the one girl said, fire. I see fi- fire. Fire. Right. I see fire. <laughs> this is about power. And who is it? That's that mother again. Mm-hmm. Talking about power. This is about And power. so she probably has some sort of, you know, being a witch, she probably connects to the force in some way. Mm-hmm. And um, I think people look at the, you know, other force users look at the Jedi as an organization who sort of monopolizes the force, you know? Yeah. And uh, so uh, she probably wants the for- you know, force for everyone, you know? And, and the Jedi have it sort of locked up in a box and you could only access it if you followed their rules. And who is allowed to use it? What is that? This is intense. So they're building this up. You know, there's there seems to be some dialogue here about the Jedi controlling who's able to wield the Force. And then the next thing you know, we see a little standoff. And then the young Jedi are in some sort of maybe a cave or, I don't know, some kind or just of... somewhere in the forest, yeah. Yeah, or somewhere in the forest. And did you hear that? And then there's a red blade that just comes tearing through chopping down trees and then ends up in the hand of a mysterious cloaked figure and all the blades a lot of yellow blades jim a lot of yellow blades there's a blue yeah, blade yeah. green blade all like drawn it. It, with you know seeing all the sabers like that you know it it kind of makes me flash back to the old tales of the jedi comic from dark horse not the animated series of shorts that's on mm. disney plus but Back in the 90s, the Tales of the Jedi comic. And uh, Yellow was a prominent blade in the pages of those books, along with many Jedi using them. And uh, it looks pretty dope. I mean, we haven't seen this many Jedi on screen since uh, probably Attack of the Clones. Yeah. Um, all on the screen at the same time. So uh, I think that looks pretty good. I don't, you know, some something tells me there's some trailer trickery going on here where the scene with the red saber blade being chucked through the forest is disconnected from this sequence here. Uh, Okay. You think so? I don't know. It's cut as if this is a response. You know, all of these blades being drawn is a response to the red blade cutting through the, the trees, but you're right. Right. Very well. Could be. That's how they cut it. Yeah. That's, You never know. And of course, there's the burden on this show to stick to canon. And in The Phantom Menace, Kiari Mundi says the Sith have been extinct for over a millennium. So this can't be a confrontation with a Sith Lord, with Jedi, if any of these Jedi are to walk away from this this little confrontation. I mean, um, well, maybe they all get mowed down. They can't report back that they encountered a Sith, or maybe this isn't a Sith at all. We've seen red bladed warriors who are not Sith in star Wars. Look no further than Asajj Ventress herself. She was not a Sith. She worked with the Sith, but she was never a Sith per se. Okay. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, uh, Darth Plagueis, the novel, is is not canon. We know that. However, we know that Darth Plagueis is canon, and we can assume that Darth Plagueis was Palpatine's mentor, was Palpatine's master. Does that mm-hmm. imply that Plagueis was, you know, he was he was also, again, not not according to official canon, but in the novel, he was a uh, uh, a businessman. He was a he was a a, a, a gangster. He was um, he was out there in the public eye, but he was obviously no one knew that he was a Sith. So when Kiati Mundi said that, here's how I interpreted it. Even back then, was yeah, you thought they were extinct for a millennium. That's the official narrative. That's the official line of the Jedi Council. Oh, he hasn't been a mm-hmm. Sith for a millennium. But right. the the cloud of the dark side has defo- has fallen on the Jedi and mm-hmm. difficult to see, et cetera, et cetera. So I mm-hmm. guess I always interpreted it as if 
that was Kiati sort of towing the line, sort of being a bit naive, but we as the viewer know that no, the Sith have been active and plotting and working their way to essentially topple you. But you also bring up a good point about, well, what is a Sith? You, you've got dark side users out there that they're not necessarily Sith. Palpatine was clearly a Sith, which would make his master, Plagueis, a Sith, and arguably his master, Tenebris, a Sith. So not necessarily been extinct for millennium. Well, yes. I mean, that's just from his perspective. I always saw Kiati Mundi was just, he was presenting the the facts as far as the Jedi knew them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were, they were pretty well convinced that the Sith had been extinguished. I mean, the threat of the dark side always remains. Sure. But the Sith as as an as as a, a way of following the force and, and and being an organization of any sort they, they thought that those days were long behind them and they thought all the sith were dead and with them all of the mysteries of the sith right, right. but little did they know but the things were happening behind the scenes with the rule of two and uh, we as an audience knew that but i was assuming the jedi were a little ignorant about all yeah that. yeah me too me too mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so naive, that has to be blind. maintained. Mm -hmm. That really does need to be maintained in this show. So if they have an encounter with a red bladed warrior, then um, they're going to have to come up with some rationale as to why that particular opponent isn't a Sith. Right. There's so. going to have to be some plausible deniability here that 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 is uh, maybe a dark side user, but but not a Sith, so that Kiati, 100 years later, can hold on to that line that, no, hey, we <laughs> yeah. wiped them out. We right, wiped them right. out. Yeah. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. All right. Well, yes. we got a uh, few The more. burden's on the storytellers, and I think they know that. So yeah. I, yeah. I think they're aware of it. I mean, didn't George Lucas have to deal with uh, General Grievous uh, never encountering um, Anakin, before. Anakin Skywalker yeah. until Revenge of the Sith? But yet he followed up the films with the Clone Wars series. And so he had to make sure that Anakin and Grievous avoided each other throughout the entire seven season run. <laughs> Which I'm so Wars. happy that they did because then that makes that moment in uh, Revenge of the Sith all, all the better after you've watched all the Clone Wars and you've seen them narrowly miss each other. Oh my God, to have been a fly on the wall in the Lucasfilm writer's room there at Skywalker Ranch when George threw out the idea that... It would probably be cool to have Anakin face off in Grievous here in this episode. When, when, uh, and then all of a sudden, what is it, Filoni? You're getting all twitchy. And it's, well, George. George. <laughs> what would he say? What would he say to George? Uh, George, uh, uh, you, you might remember that uh, in Revenge of the Sith, uh, you know, uh, Anakin hadn't actually met Grievous before he, that he expected Anakin would be a little older. Remember that? Mm -hmm. George chews on his pencil for a second, rubs his beard, stands up and says, well, that sounds like a you problem. I'm out of here. <laughs> and he takes off. He goes I'll to Monaco to see years. the Grand Prix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off to Monaco. <laughs> see you later, Gator. Thinks he's wearing those khaki shorts and that long sleeve plaid shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's a you problem. Oh man! <laughs> All right. So, uh, so what else do the... we have left in this? Uh, Not much <laughs> longer. Saber. Oh, that was important. It, it appears a big down. like red explosion of some sort erupts. Ooh, like mist. Yes, and it topples over all of these very gung-ho Jedi. Yeah, they come running towards the, yep, and the mist just blows them back. And in the midst of it is an unknown figure. Yeah. Looks like that fight's over before it even began. Right, and Kind of like go. Tyson versus Michael Spinks. Boom. Hey, can I? Hit the canvas. Can I throw out a gripe here? When I sure. saw this, I was, I was like, why is the O... In the in the animated version of the logo, 
Why is that oh a ring? I'm not gonna uh, there's not gonna be a ring in this, is there? Oh, it kind of does spin around Doesn't like it? it looks like a ring you would put on your finger. Right, right. Like, oh, is this gonna be the ring to rule all the Jedi? <laughs> that'd, be, like, that'd be something else, man. <laughs> One ring. My precious. You know, wait, my <laughs> why did I hear this? Precious. Well, if that's the only complaint you have, you are uh, in a much better headspace than about uh, 75% of Star Wars fans on the internet this week. Uh, yeah, and, uh, right. Many of them are losing their crap over this thing. I don't know. I thought the it, it looked good. It, it wasn't great. It didn't, like, melt my face or blow me away. But, I mean, it certainly presented a lot of cool elements for a Star Wars TV show. You know, I saw one person go, I don't know, the trailer for the new alien film blows us out of the water well you know one is a film and the other is a streaming series on tv it's there is a difference and there there's two always things. going to be a difference i'm not trying to make any excuses or anything but i just you know thought that was an apples to oranges sort of i argument agree on there. not only is one a film and one a tv series they're completely different franchises with different visual languages with <laughs> different themes different vibes come on all right well i took some notes here i uh because uh leslie headland then got thrown into uh some media circles and uh talked to some of the typical players um starting with the hollywood reporter in their report and interview with leslie it's revealed that the series is set a century before the phantom menace now, we've been getting mixed singles on this mm -hmm. since this series was announced. Very recently, we saw a reputable source saying 50 years before the, right. the prequels. This says a century. And a lot of the coverage I've been seeing this week since the trailer dropped says 100 years before The Phantom Menace. So, mm. you can okay. You can still... Slide a Yoda in there, you know. He's he'll be a spry like seven hundred years old. So, well, and Yoda a, has shown up in some of the previous High Republic material. True, true. So, set a century before Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, Amanda Stenberg's mysterious character May appears to be hunting Jedi during a time of peace near the end of the High Republic era. The show will be taking a page out of Rashomon's playbook. When was the last time we heard that being applied to Star Wars? Do you remember? Rashomon? I don't. Rashomon, Rashomon is a film from uh, the early 50s, directed by Akira Kurosawa. Mm. And it was a story about a samurai getting killed in the forest. And there were witnesses to this event. And uh, even psychics are brought in to uh, explain what happened. And everyone who recounts what happened is telling a different story. So it's exploring different perspectives of the same event. And that's what Rashomon is all about. And it was employed in uh, The Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson's film, when he was showing the flashbacks to that night Luke was considering killing Ben Solo in his sleep. Oh, geez. Right. So, right. Yes. yes. And, and so, so there you go. So for better or for worse, uh, Rashomon and you know, it's, it's real easy for star Wars creators to, uh, to find inspiration in Kurosawa because George Lucas famously said Kurosawa was an influence, but I think it's being very small minded just to pick one influence of star Wars. I think you should always be looking at, the full pie, not just individual slices. And Star Wars was inspired by samurai films and Kurosawa. It was inspired by pulp fiction novels like The Lensman and like Dune. And it was influenced by World War II and, and World War II films and actual events. And, of course, and you throw in Joseph Campbell into the mix and the classic American Western. Star Wars is a melting pot. And I think you should, when you're making Star Wars stories, I think you're taking shortcuts. And Filoni does this all the time. And now it's happening again with the Acolyte, where it's like, we're just going to focus on this. Right. Uh, right this right. little slice of the pie instead of the full pie. 
You know, it's easy to understand these individual influences, but I think it's really hard to decipher what makes them work together when they're all thrown into the recipe. I think that's the true challenge Star Wars storytellers face in this particular era of storytelling. Um, So, back to my notes. (laughs) Um, The Master Saul, played by uh, Lee Young Jae from Squid Game, and um, Amanda Stenberg, May, they have a history. And it is, uh, let me look deeper in my notes, because uh, according to Entertainment Weekly, the story ultimately hinges on the complicated history between May and Master Saul, mm-hmm. describing it as a complex, almost father-daughter-like relationship. So something tells me Master Saul was May's... Jedi master at one point, but that's, that's kind of easy. You know, it's, it's kind of easy, um, to, to come to that conclusion. It, it could be something far, you know, different. I mean, maybe master soul has like a second family outside of the Jedi temple and hmm. may is his daughter in real, for but, real. but, I've got a I've got a description that goes back to oh, when was this? This was back in January, mm-hmm. and this was breaking down all of the future projects coming out. And this says that the acolyte is described as a mystery thriller in which a former Padawan reunites with her Jedi Master to investigate a series of crimes. But the forces they confront are more sinister than they ever anticipated. Though character details are scarce, we understand Amanda Stenberg as the Padawan and Zheng Li Zhe is the former Jedi Master. So May, the assassin, like you were saying, but they they build her up to sort of be the villain in this trailer or to be a Mm -hmm. villainous type character who's obviously left the Jedi Order, left her, her master, now she's working her way back. She's obviously fighting her way back. And then they're reunited in, in some way. And perhaps she's the one that's bringing uh, the news of the evil that's on the march or, or, or something like that. Could be. That, that very well could be. Um, to throw the Rashomon influence into it, um, Master Saul and May will offer their points of view on their shared conflict. Mm. So the, the, they will probably get together at some point and debate it out. And, uh, you know, he's seeing it one way, she's seeing it another way. And we'll see both and, play out. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting twist. So the way that May is presented in the trailer makes it appear that she is the villain. Right. Um, but it, it could be, we could be looking at something that's not what it appears to be. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, well, you know, so far so good. As far as, like, the martial arts stuff, I, I like all that stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, the Acolyte will begin to unravel how an esteemed organization like the Jedi Order could be in its golden age and also on the cusp of the chaos that unfolds in the Skywalker saga. So we're going to see dents Mm. in the armor, you know, tears in the fabric, and it's going to be obvious, you know, it's going to be obvious. Right. Right. Um, And also the show is going to explore how did the Sith go from the rule of two and being, quote, extinct, to suddenly Palpatine comes into power without the Jedi even knowing it. You know, uh, that's um, without knowing that he possesses uh, evilness. Right. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they thought he was, you know, a good guy. He was, you know. Yeah, he was just a senator a from decent Naboo. politician. You know, they were hanging out in his apartment and stuff. <laughs> and, you know. Right. <laughs> He's helping... Uh... Helping Queen Amidala sort out that trade federation dispute. It's a lot to sort out. Yeah, to sign the treaty. So the the show looks pretty interesting. It's only, you know, a little more than a couple of months away. I love the addition of new Star Wars and things for us to talk about. The the reaction online has been, you know, pretty rough stuff um, by a lot of people. Um, 
And I just think that that's the result of fans losing confidence in Lucasfilm. And so it, it's, it's, it's a you problem, Lucasfilm. <laughs> it's a you problem. And, yeah. um, and uh, I, I think a lot of people are, are getting a little uh, burnt out on um, less than stellar content coming from San Francisco and Lucasfilm. So um, it's, it's kind of boiling up to uh, the surface now. And um, naturally, people don't know what the Acolyte is. Or what really to expect from it. And um, so, you know, people often fear the unknown. And uh, it's easy to crap on something when you've not experienced it yet. Um, I'm trying to be open-minded about it. Yeah. Know? Am I expecting the greatest Star Wars I ever saw? No. Do I hope I'll be uh, surprised and, and, and happy with the... Uh, and you know the the content they produce and and get, throw at us, yeah, I I really hope so. You know, I I hope so. But also, I was really gung ho about that Ahsoka series, so I didn't give that show a free pass just because I love the characters and I've always <laughs> respected Dave Filoni and I thought the casting was great and the show looked great. It all comes down to story for me and how well fleshed out and developed these characters are, how well they earn their status and, and how well they earn their advancements as characters throughout the story. Um, and how well I could connect and relate to them. Can I walk in lockstep with the main characters as they're going through their adventure or do I feel shut out and left in the dark? Like I did with Ahsoka a lot of yeah, times where I felt, much. I felt Filoni was, was being too presumptuous about what fans had in their heads already about star Wars. I think he, 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 he played off of that so much that it really ultimately destroyed the drama in the whole story. And so, yeah, I'm not giving this show a free pass, but I'm certainly open-minded to it and I'm rooting for it to be great. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I share a lot of those thoughts. I, I will say as far as, uh, the trailer goes, there was nothing in the trailer that I thought was, uh, Mind blowing, you know, or something that just made me go, "Whoa, I've got to see this." It, yeah, there were it, none of those. It ones. felt about like I expected, and so my 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 expectations were neither surpassed. Uh, I guess they were just met. My expectations were met, and I can't say that my expectations are super high these days either. I mean, we're having a blast talking about it. 24 minute per episode bad batch season we're having a lot of fun and, and part of that fun is that the characters are giving us so much to talk about because the characters are unfolding and in and evolving right in front of our eyes and i think because it's animation we're going to be perhaps a, a, our expectations are going to be maybe a little bit uh, tempered but when you get into live action and those big budgets and all of the the players that are involved, um, yeah, won't be necessarily as forgiving. But I will say, um, I don't think we're giving Bad Batch a pass either. And it's really fun, good Star Wars that we're enjoying talking about every week. So the trailer, I don't think, is all that great. I was really bummed about the the graphic that they put out, it was like a, a poster, the logo, we've got a logo up on screen. That's not, not the same. And uh, it has that tagline about uh, darkness uh, coming through the light or whatever. And if you notice, I, I need to find it because uh, it's, it's worth it's, I think it's worth talking about because the, um, the, the, the icon, the star Wars logo mm -hmm. is so buried in the artwork <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Here it is. In an age of light, a darkness, uh, and a, a darkness rises. So let's take a look at this uh, this artwork here. Um, it's got this lightsaber hilt with kind of a streaky. I don't know if we're supposed to assume this is blood, but sort of a crimson streak that's coming out of it. It's an unignited blade, but I I, I guess we're supposed to assume it's blood. And it's sort of I on do. a marbly background. You think it's blood? Yeah. Yeah, it's blood. But if you want blood, you've got look it. Look at this. 
Look at this Star Wars logo. It's I mean, comically you you small. See it. Yeah. Way down here in the bottom right. It's fine print. It is it is literal fine print. It says yeah. Star Wars, the Acolyte, June 4th, and has the Disney Plus logo. W Look, if you're trying, to, the marketing is just not great. If you're trying to market <laughs> to... Look, we're going to show up for it because we are plugged in, tuned in. But I'm thinking about, you know, reactivating dormant or semi-dormant Star Wars fans with something really new and fresh and cool. And I would put Star Wars above everything. That's the brand. That's mm -hmm. the brand. There's no brand with Acolyte. There's not no. even all that much of a brand with Disney Plus compared to Star Wars on a global stage. So Star Wars is smaller, dude. The smaller Star Wars is smaller than the release date. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and of course the Disney Plus logo is larger than both. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah. well, you know. Look, that's the marketing. That's the packaging. That's not the content. That's not the show. I'm like you, Jim. I'm always rooting for Star Wars to win. I want it to be great and we'll be here for it. And we'll break down each and every episode. Um, but I wish I could sit here and say, oh, did you see when, like, I can't tell a but I can't ring up my brother and say, dude, you got to watch this trailer and <laughs> wait until you see blank. Yeah. There's no wait till you see it all in the trailer. Yeah. Very true. Very true. I mean, I the guess witch, it is the witch looks like she just wa walked out of Wakanda. Like everything, we've, we've seen everything. There's nothing new here. Everything looks derivative. Nothing looks original. You, you may have a point there. You may have a point there. I, I thought it was pretty cool when that saber flew through the forest and chopped up the trees. And that was cool. was cool. That was cool. When, the, when the, the young Jedi all lit up their blades and got eight of them rushing into a certain doom. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, there's, there's certain things. Um, but, uh, but I don't have my mind. Have made up. I don't want, it. I don't want, I make no mistake. I'm not sitting too here many saying, people, too many fans have their mind <laughs> right. made up already about this. And I, I think that's premature. I think you have to at least sit through the first episode before you really start. And it's a two parter. You know, I think they already announced that there'll mm -hmm. be two episodes yes. on June 4th. If you're going to participate in online fandom and be popping off left and right with your opinions, School yourself first. At least watch the first couple of episodes. Yeah. Then I'll listen to what you have to say. And you know what? You're going to have to listen to what I have to say, too. <laughs> and good or bad, I'm going to tell you, it. you know, like it is, like how I see it. So this show certainly isn't going to get a free pass from me. But I appreciate the freshness. I appreciate the, the a different direction, a different era, a prequel to the prequel. <laughs> You know, the earliest live action Star Wars uh, on the timeline. So let's see how it goes. Let's see. If, if it flops, uh, then we could fall back on Rogue Squadron because apparently that's back in the mix. <laughs> yeah, can, can you believe it? Just when you thought it was safe, uh, here comes Patty Jenkins. She must have been hearing all that talk uh, that Charmino Bade Chinoy has been saying about, hey, it's about time a woman be. Uh, what was it? Uh, I can't have the I don't opportunity have a to tell a, a story in the Star Wars universe. Right, right. Something like that. I, I want to make sure uh, that we, we quote it pro properly because <laughs> it's, but yeah, basically that a woman be, be telling a Star Wars story. But Patty Jenkins was the first one tapped before Charmaine obeyed Shinoi. There was Patty Jenkins and Rogue Squadron. And then it was announced that the Rogue, Rogue Squadron film was uh, indefinitely postponed i don't think they ever said canceled they indefinitely postponed or some kind of they just removed like it from the schedule is what happened they never they commented removed, on it yeah there really was no comment uh. made about it from what we understand from reports we've heard there was friction between lucasfilm and patty over the script and you know Pat, patty was hired because she was definitely flavor of the month with that wonder woman film and Lucasfilm was very gung-ho on getting a female director behind the camera for one of their feature films. And Patty just seemed like a perfect match. And she still very well might be. 
now that she's been given a second chance. She appeared on the show Talking Pictures with host Ben Mankiewicz. And Ben asked her flat out about Rogue Squadron. And who would have thought she'd have news about (laughs) Rogue Squadron, but she gave us this update. When I left Star Wars to do Wonder Woman 3, um, and I went and I started working on that, we talked about, okay, well, maybe I'll come back to Star Wars after Wonder Woman 3. So we did a deal for that to happen, started a deal, but I thought I was doing Wonder Woman 3. So when Wonder Woman 3 then went away, Lucasfilm and I were like, oh, we got to finish this deal. We finished the deal right as the strike was beginning. So I now owe a draft of Star Wars. And so we will see what happens there. You know, like who, who knows? It's, it's a, it's a, they have a hard job in front of them of what's the first movie they're going to do. They have other directors who have been working, but I am now, uh, you know, I'm back on doing Rogue Squadron and we'll see what happens. We need to develop, you know, get it to where we're both but super happy with it. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Do you think Kathleen Kennedy knows that Patty Jenkins is back on Rogue Squadron? Yeah. I do. Okay. All right. All right. I just, <laughs> I do. I just wondered if, uh, if only Patty Jenkins knew that Patty Jenkins was working on Star Wars again. Well, I, I think the obvious thing to look at here is the announcement in April 2023, not even a year ago, that um, three movies were in the works. One, was a film about Ray that was to be directed by Charmino Bechinoy. The other was a movie about the birth of the Jedi mm-hmm. to be directed by James Mangold. Mm-hmm. And the third was a Filoni Mandoverse big event. Right. Like the Star Wars equivalent of the Avengers. Yes. Um, well, what's happened here? Uh, Mangold is wrapped up with the Bob Dylan movie that he's making with Timothy Chalamet, and he may or may not have another project in the works to go into production right after that. I'm thinking about Swamp Thing. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, The Filoni thing is years off in the future. Right. It's just not time for that yet. Right. Right. So all bets were on the Ray film being the next film to get released. And I firmly believe that Lucasfilm believed that in April 2023 when they announced it, that that would be the next Star Wars movie. And they're getting kind of desperate because Rogue Squadron was supposed to come out last December. But that whole production blew up because I believe Patty was having a hard time working with some members at Lucasfilm. I'm thinking uh, I heard something about her bumping heads with Michelle Rejwan. Um, I also think that Patty's stock dipped a little bit after Wonder Woman 2, which was a fiasco, very hard to watch. Mm-hmm. That whole project blew up, and December 2023 came and went with no Rogue Squadron film. Mac went to the Even- theater. Fully expecting to see it that night. Not only did I go to the theater that night, I camped out for two weeks. Oh, man. I was like, (laughs) where's the news coverage? How come the local TV stations aren't coming out here? You were probably wondering why no one else was camped out. No one. Well, there were other people camped out. But, you know, downtown Chicago, I'm not so sure they were Star Wars fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I so, hear you. <laughs> so, so now all of a sudden uh, the, the year begins with a surprise announcement that The Mandalorian is going to the feature films. And that, by all accounts, appears to be the next Star Wars film. That seems like a bit really, of a Hail Mary move. That's a Hail Mary because yeah. what has happened is the Ray film is in production hell right now. It's in pre-production hell. They can't find a good script. They've tried several writers up to this point. And from what I understand, Daisy Ridley has not seen a script yet, nor has Stephen Wright turned in his, or not Stephen Wright, uh, Stephen uh, Knight. Knight. Mm -hmm. He has not turned in his script yet. And he's been working on the sucker for like almost a year now. Obviously, that film is not going to be ready to go in front of cameras till next year at the earliest. 
Bob Iger is back at Disney, and he's up in the ivory tower, and he's much more agitated than he's ever been. <laughs> he's got a hair trigger, and he, all of these projects are. No, he's involved if, in proxy wars uh, on the board. There's all kinds of stockholders. Yeah, it's not a good time for him. So, and it's not a good time for Lucasfilm to be coming completely incompetent when it comes to shooting a film and getting it out to theaters. This is the Star Wars brand. There are multiple eras in which they can concoct a story from, yet they can't do it. So fans, obviously, this is a source of a lot of fans losing confidence in Lucasfilm and why they're going to jump all over something like the Acolyte trailer is because the confidence level isn't there. Right. Because what's going on at Lucasfilm? Why can't they produce a single Star Wars film? The earliest they'll be able to get one out there is in 2026. That's seven years after The Rise of Skywalker was in the theaters. Seven years. Did anyone think when George Lucas was signing those papers and handing it over to Disney that there would be any downtime with Star Wars whatsoever? Especially in the wake of all the success Marvel has been having? They just can't get it going. So they're looking back at other things, and they're calling Patty Jenkins back in. Mm. They might even, you know, who who's next in the Rolodex? Guillermo del Toro. Didn't he have an idea about Jabba the Hutt? Ryan get Johnson. Him in here. Come on. Where's that trilogy that they've never officially uh, well, canceled? <laughs> they, I mean, even Lucasfilm knows that bringing Ryan Johnson into the fold to do another Star Wars film is playing with fire. They know that they because the, the fan reaction to anything he does, even if it's great, will be they'll condemn it before eyes even see it. So, yeah. it, you know, and it, it's it's a tough uphill battle right now that the Disney studio is having with all of its properties. But Star Wars seems to be the real trouble child in the uh, in the portfolio. Yet Star Wars hasn't produced a massive flop yet. Like the Marvels, right? Or, or you know, some of those DC properties, or even, even tried and true Disney properties, like the Haunted Mansion, massive flop, massive. Flop. I saw that movie too. It wasn't half bad. Oh, really? But I mean, is it better than the Eddie Murphy it, one? It's about on par with the Eddie oh, Murphy. Oh, okay. One. Yes, there's elements of it that you like better, and then there's elements of the Eddie Murphy thing you kind of liked, and. When you mix them together, you you get an almost better than mediocre movie. <laughs> All right, bring in the fan edits. Can you mix them? Yeah. Where's Topher Grace? Oh, that's that's not a bad idea. <laughs> you can't get Topher on the line. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. So that's what's happening, though. Yeah. Uh, Rogue Squadron's back on. I think this is another Hail Mary pass coming from Lucasfilm. Wow. Wow. You know, they, Amazing. They, they got so far along in that. And also, Michelle Regwan's no longer with the company. Mm. Um, so that I might make things to, different for Patty. It might. It might. I think that's where the real headbutting was coming from. That's that's according to a report I heard. Uh, Patty did continue to talk about Star Wars in the interview with Ben Mankiewicz on Talking Pictures, and she uh, explained what is it about Star Wars that uh, attracts her to it so much? Why does she want to make a Star Wars film? Star Wars was born out of World War II, right? It's born out of how oh, sure. do you Absolutely. how do you make a metaphor uh, and and talk in metaphor. In that way, I've always wanted to make a fighter pilot movie. It's been a dream of mine. I always was in had a hard time with it because I'm in love with the jets of the 70s and and 80s and that's not where the great dogfight stories are. And so, uh, you know, so Wonder, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Star Wars becomes a great playground for that. I think Star Wars, Wars is so beautiful. So yes, if I can do something beautiful and do something that that serves that audience and is great, I would love to do it. You know, that is the thing that really attracted me to Patty Jenkins was the fact that she's a military kid. Her father was a fighter pilot, um, and so she she gets that culture and. I think she would, I would hope, want to honor that culture by bringing a authenticity to it. And so, I, I, from that aspect, I'm 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 jazzed about it. The thing that I never really loved about the Rogue Squadron concept was that it was New Republic era. That it was it was post 
Um, it was in the sequel era, and that 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 never really got me excited. I would much rather see something take place maybe in between a couple of the original trilogy films with Rogue Squadron and recast guys like Wedge and 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 do something along those lines and not something in the post sequel trilogy time frame. So I love the idea just not that era. And who knows? Yeah, I would that could that could be scrapped. I would much rather see original trilogy era. The rogues as we know them, you mm-hmm. know. Give me a hobby. What Why about not? a Zach or Dak? What was his name? <laughs> Dak. <laughs> yeah, where's Dak? We know what happens. Feels to like, Dak. He feels like he could take on the Empire all by himself. I yeah. want to see a show about him. Right. Give me Dak. So uh, you know, but I, I, I do think. By the way, if that happens, he'll be saying that line three or four times throughout the movie. Oh, I feel like I could take on the Empire myself, <laughs> and then that every scene he's finally in. in Empire, bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boy, is this guy? He's, man, he's pretty gung ho. It's like kind of. <laughs> It's almost a, a little annoying. <laughs> saying, you know. I'll tell you, one I appreciate the sentiment. I mean, really, the first time he said it, it really pumped me up. But like by the fifteenth time he said it, I was like, "Hey, this is getting kind of old," you know. I mean, <laughs> and I, I appreciate it, but uh, we yeah, get it, Dak. Know, we get it. You know, let's come up with something new. You know, I mean, that was a good line. I, I, I know you got more in you, <laughs> but you keep saying you feel like you could take. And also, you know, what does that say about me? Your fellow pilot, you think you could take on the empire all by yourself? What am I, chop liver well, here? Let's all just get out of Dak's way, yeah, and let okay. him take the lead here. This, yeah, Sorry it's all we've about been Dak. slowing you down. All about Dak, isn't it? <laughs> it's always, always been about Dak. It's always, always been about Dak. Man, you mm. know Dak's a dick. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm so sick of Dak. I'm so sick of Dak. I'm going to start calling him just Dick. <laughs> well, there you go. There's your Rogue Squadron update. <laughs> Aren't you glad you asked? I bet you are. Right now, I feel like I take on the whole empire myself. Your source for the force. Boy, it just seems like yesterday we were saying goodbye to uh, another member of the Star Wars family. And we got another one this week. Uh, Michael Culver, Captain Nita. From The Empire Strikes Back. Jim, he was uh, talking about an iconic scene. One of my favorites, actually. And uh, it really does show off Darth Vader, you know, with that that great line about apologies. Every time I apologize Mm. or anyone apologizes to me, which, by the way, is very rare these days. Uh, I'm a married man. I don't get apologized to very often. So when I do get one. This line always comes to my head immediately (laughs) and Vader's actions. Uh, Michael Culver uh, did a lot in his 84 years, not just Empire Strikes Back, but a career that spanned more than 50 years. But boy, it was that scene in that film that made him famous. But uh, what was so wonderful about it (laughs) is uh, Vader had already killed Admiral Ozzel. So we knew when Nita turned around with egg on his face after losing the Millennium Falcon, Uh and he was going to apologize to Lord Vader personally. Everyone in the audience knew, oh, my God. (laughs) Well, he thinks that that's the the trick. Ozzel was was an ass. Ozzel was was very arrogant. Mm -hmm. And Nita's thinking, look, come on. He's a, he puts his leather pants on one leg at a time, like the rest yeah. of us, followed by a face mask and a helmet. I'm just going to go in and apologize. You know, you can catch more flies with honey. You can't catch the Millennium Falcon with honey, but you can catch more flies with it. So I'm going to go try to sweeten up Darth Vader and apologize to him <laughs> personally. And uh, so uh, we... we <laughs> We can't continue to talk about Captain Nita without actually seeing the scene from Empire Strikes Back, the famous uh, scene that made uh, Michael Culver famous in Star Wars circles as Captain Nita. They may come around for another pass. Captain Nita, 
The ship no longer appears on our scopes. They can't have disappeared. No ship that small has a cloaking device. Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the pursuit. Get a shuttle ready. I shall assume full responsibility for losing them and apologize to Lord Vader. Cerveza Cristal! Oh. Oh. Cerveza Cristal! Oh. Oh. <laughs> Apology accepted, Captain Nida. You know, I gotta say, <laughs> I've seen a lot of the Cerveza Crystals. In this one, this one, they really had a lot of gall to uh, interrupt <laughs> the drama and the suspense that was, you know, being built up at this moment. I, 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 th know. I think I, Cerveza was really just pushing, pushing a little too far here. If you're gonna go apologize to the Dark Lord, you better be walking in there with an igloo <laughs> cooler filled with beer. You know, look, I screwed up. I lost the Millennium Falcon, but I got a 12er in this cooler, Darth. Let's unwind a little bit. You know Just, what my what my favorite part of the uh, Captain Eda death scene is? Is when they remove his body and he's literally helping himself up. He's lifting himself yeah. up with his, with yeah, his legs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he pulls himself right up. It's so obvious. <laughs> like, you know, there's two stormtroopers there. Let them drag you out. Right. Oh, no. But, yeah, he gets a, he gets a, practically jumps in one of the troopers' <laughs> arms. <laughs> Captain oh. Nita. He will be missed. He yeah, RIP to uh, Michael Culver. I tell you, you know, if you're going to these conventions and you're an autograph collector, mm -hmm. you know, these these guys, I, I it's, it's, it's tough, but they're of a certain age and a certain generation that they're not going to be around forever. And so if there's somebody that you really want to meet and you see that they're making a con appearance and you've always wanted to get their autograph, go, go to it. Jump in the car, get in a plane and go do it because you never know if there will be another opportunity. Yeah, and his appearances in the States were r rather rare. Um, his agent mentioned that uh, a real highlight was taking Michael to celebration in Chicago in 2019. He was at a loss for words when he saw the line with nearly 200 people waiting to see him. That's what his agent said. And, uh, you know, he, he felt like it was an honor to, uh, to be uh, rubbing elbows with fans and, and talking about... Uh, tiny role he had in yeah. a very very big film and i mean you know the scene is iconic even 30 rock had something to say about captain nita in one of their episodes oh even when it's something normal i hate going up to jack's office i always feel like i'm entering the death star i expect to see stormtroopers i'm telling you if donaghy does this at me i will run you'll be fine Captain Nita. No, Captain Nita dies. He dies. <laughs> I think Liz was on her way in to talk to Jack about something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you'll be fine, Captain Nita. Talk yeah. about, you know, how it's reached the pop culture stratosphere. But with uh, credits like Goodbye, Mr. Chips. And uh, a lot, I mean, 1938, he was born and uh, just did a, a ton of films over the over the years uh but he'll always be captain nita to us so rest in peace michael culver mm -hmm. we shall forever accept your apology <laughs> captain <Nita. laughs> oh well said well said all right well you know what time it is it is time to check in with the incredible incredible uh feat of literary skill and prowess that is what have we here the autobiography of billy d williams we've been yeah listening to the audiobook jim jimmy mack has been combing through every single word to pull out yes. the best of the best but only one jim only one each week uh clip will be given the title of billy d quote of the week Absolutely. And uh, we have some contenders this week before we get to the actual quote of the week. Um, I'm at the part of the audiobook where he talks about the return of Lando in Solo, a Star Wars story. And Billy D talks about young Lando 
and how when hearing the news that the character was going to be coming back, Billy D started, uh, you know, wishing he could flip the pages of the calendar in reverse <laughs> and throw on that cape one more time. He talks about it here. Disney announced production of Solo, a Star Wars story. The movie jumped back in time to tell the origin of young Han Solo, which included the start of his friendship with Lando Calrissian, then the swaggering young owner of the Millennium Falcon. In the spirit of full disclosure, I wish that I had been able to jump back in time to play young Lando, because in my mind there was and ever will be only one Lando, and that's me. <laughs> However, I was too old to swagger anywhere, and the job of getting behind the Millennium's controls went to Donald Glover. So there you go. He wanted. Yeah. He he wanted it. Do you remember? Uh, when uh, or I remember when uh, casting was announced for the '89 Batman movie with Michael Keaton and Adam West was making headlines saying, "What about me? <laughs> what about me? I can put the cowl and the cape on one more time, and you know nobody wanted to tell because we love Adam West. You know he's the white, well, he's the I'm bright knight." And I'm surprised. I'm surprised he said that he'd be able to pull himself away from all those worlds of wheels appearances he was making. <laughs> I believe in, that that's where these comments were being made from, was being afraid from all those I saw him at World of Wheels in Chicago one year, and he was he was like 60-something, and he was in full Batman costume. Oh, he, he was out, really? Yeah, Still yeah, he was the there costume. with Burt Ward, also in costume. Oh man! And there's nothing like seeing a dude that age wearing those tights. <laughs> oh, Amazing! Wow. Amazing! Wow! So Amazing. yeah, Billy D. Uh, un, you know, like Adam West, uh, thought for a split second, wouldn't it be great? I wish I could do it. But unlike Adam West, Billy D. realized that the time had already passed him to play such a spry right. version of the character. And in this next cut, you'll hear he even thinks Donald Glover was a good choice for the role. I respected the choice. I respected Donald not only as an immensely talented young man, but also a person of character for the way he reached out to me and arranged for the two of us to get together. He did it out of respect, and I appreciated that gesture. I also think he was genuinely curious to find out how I had approached the role back in 1980 which was three years before Donald was born. We met at a restaurant in Los Feliz. It was just the two of us, and I found him to be a delightful human being and extraordinary young man. I'd listened to some of the music he made as childish Gambino and watched a few episodes of his FX series, Atlanta. He was in movies, TV, and music. He defied labels. He personified my favorite word, eclectic. I had always seen myself that way, interested in everything, diverse, not wanting to be limited. That's Billy. That is Billy D. He's a bit of a renaissance man. Painter. Can't hold him back. Musician, right. he, singer. He could never be defined throughout his whole career. He was a recording artist. He was appearing on stage and then in film. And then, you know, in, in films of serious subject matter. Then he segued into the mainstream with Star Wars. And, uh, I mean, he was a mainstream actor in the 60s and 70s. And, I mean, he was, he was like a, a you know, they, they looked at him as, as a real sex symbol. In the 70s. I, yeah, I mean, very much really, so. Like the definition of that. And then, uh, yeah, he, he segued into Star Wars, which really put him in front of a worldwide audience. And he's still acting to this day. He paints. And he, his artistry in the bedroom is uh, probably <laughs> something. <laughs> you know, I, I can't comment on that for sure. But, um, I've heard stories. But that's, that's neither here nor there when we're talking about young Lando. And uh, Billy D. Uh, reveals he did offer some advice to Donald Glover. 
I told Donald about the way I had approached Lando and the excitement I had felt when I first heard his name and read that he wore a cape. It was a different time, I explained, a different era. Computers were brand new. Cell phones hadn't been invented. And the idea of a black man in space was unimaginable to some and downright revolutionary to others. But for me, it made perfect sense. And I was ready, ready to bring to the screen something completely unique and my own. That seemed to amuse Donald. I didn't play Lando as a black man, I explained. That would have been the usual cliché, which they would have got if not for me. But I was in my own small way trying to say something about Lando that most people couldn't or wouldn't talk about. To me, he was the future. Lando was a futurist. You never see what he invents, but it was always obvious to me and has become more so over the years. He invents himself. I might have gone on a little long, the prerogative of age, but Donald took it all in with genuine interest. He asked good questions. He also shared ideas of his own. At the end of lunch, I summed up everything I thought he needed to know in three words. Just be charming. Yeah. <laughs> Solo came out in Whoa. Oh, 2017. Right, you can stop it. That one. You can stop it. All right. Yeah, he did say you know, the prerogative of old age was rambling on and on. And <laughs> even with our audio production, that comes into play. You know, I do love what he says there about uh, how he, he wasn't approaching the role as a, a black man. He says, but had anyone else been cast... That's exactly what they would have gotten. They would have gotten a cliche, but he was doing something different. And that's that's important. I, I really think that that speaks to the character and why the character was so um, important and someone that we all looked up to. It didn't matter what skin color was. We knew he was cool. We knew he was sexy. We knew he was he had the the the, the talent and the skills and the charm to do what we all wanted to do. All of us guys wanted to do what Lando was able to do. Skin color never entered into it at all. And really, it, it would have been a very different character and probably not nearly as memorable if it wasn't played by Billy D. Williams, which leads us to the quote of the week. <laughs> oh, all right. So here it is. Out of uh, all of those uh, recollections we were just getting there from Billy D., only one quote of his can be considered the... Billy D. Quote of the Week. So let's hear what it is. This is Billy D. Williams, Lando Calrissian. It's time for the Quote of the Week. In my mind, there was and ever will be only one Lando, and that's me. Yes. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Mike you know drop. that's how he feels. Mike, Mike drop. drop indeed. Yeah. All right. So uh, here's a story for you. Um C-3PO himself, Anthony Daniels, has decided that it is time to part ways with some of his memorabilia that he's collected over the years. In fact, there was an auction out in L.A. on uh, March 13th, so just uh, a few days ago, that took place, and some of Anthony Daniels' incredible, incredible collection of C-3PO memorabilia went on the block and dang <laughs> here he is in a, a picture that we have on screen for our all access members uh, Anthony Daniels holding a screen used still working meaning the eyes still light up C-3PO helmet mask from Return of the Jedi and it sold <laughs> at auction for 800 $50,000, nearly a wow. million dollars for this. Uh, Steve Sansweet yeah, was, was not an... available for comment after he purchased the... No, <laughs> we know. He has since taken a vow of silence. <laughs> but incredible. Um, and uh, 
you know, these again, as we were talking about with uh, with Culver, these guys are are getting up in years. And Anthony Daniels was asked by um, the reporter at Hollywood Reporter that was covering this about why now. Um, oh, we actually have a clip of that, don't we? I, I don't need to. I don't need to talk about it. We got a clip of it. Let's hear the clip. I've been involved with Star Wars for nearly 50 years now. Can you imagine? I think I was around 27 years old, roughly, when I first met George Lucas. 50 years later, I don't know, it's time to move on, time to put things away, time to look into the future. Why, why am I moving all these things on? It's because I've never had a house big enough for a big private collection. And I've seen other people's, you know, major fans around the world have rooms full of glass boxes and vitrines and so on, displaying um, dust-free and in environments that uh, will look after the, the items. I've never had a room big enough for that. I'm not sure I would have ever done it myself. But then I realized over the last few years that a lot of these things are in boxes and in cupboards and in the attic and, and whatever. And nobody gets to share them. Nobody gets to say, wow, this, this really was on a movie set and this you know, was worn by Anthony Daniels, whatever. Um, and it just seemed a sensible point in my life to share. Wow. Uh, gosh, I keep share. looking at that. At that, <laughs> to share <laughs> to share for eight hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollars to make a fortune. <laughs> and you know what's amazing, Swank? It, this is the second C three PO head he has auctioned off in the last six months. Back in November, another prop store auction featured a C three PO head from Daniel's collection that was used in A New Hope. Oh, and that particular item it was it, they said it could make 1.2 million it sold for 843,051 bucks oh. so th this one that sold last week went for 843,000 750 bucks. So it sold for seven. It, it's appreciated now. C3PO heads <laughs> have appreciated in the last month to, by seven hundred dollars. Wow! So, wow! Wow! I, that's that, it's beating the market. Um, what what it's amazing to me about this one uh, with uh, and Jedi is the, the eyes still light up. And I don't know if the eyes lit lit up on the A New Hope one, but I would think that the A New Hope one would be more rare and would fetch more money. So there must be something extra special about this three PO head that it would uh, fetch a little bit more. I believe, yes, because it's fully functional still, that it commands greater value, yeah. at least $700, $700 more. <laughs> but apparently it wasn't just Anthony Daniels items that were being auctioned, and we know that because our good pal F.J. DeSanto was actually there. And F.J. Uh, is going to join us here right now and tell us about his first-person account at being there for this major prop store auction event nice fj thanks for checking in hello guys hey i'm very happy to be back i haven't been back since blake and <laughs> now that he's like putting on wigs dressing as anakin i'm even more scared shitless of him <laughs> so i'm glad it's just me this time well we're certainly glad to have you and also glad to have your firsthand account of this auction uh, Anthony Daniels, we were talking about the story that was in the Hollywood Reporter and how he felt that it was really time for him to part ways with this memorabilia. He's 78 years old. His wife doesn't want the stuff. She said, why don't you sell it now? You know, don't what are you going to leave it to me for? I'm just going to have to turn around and sell it. And I suspect, you know, that as these actors and these the, the creatives who are involved, especially in the original trilogy, they're getting up in years. And I think this is probably just the beginning of this type of thing that we're going to see offloading all this stuff. But you were there in person. What are these things like? I mean, were you actually there? Was this what kind of event was this? Or were you there for the actual gavel? What did you see? No, 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 no. What it was was so it was two two Mondays ago. It was the preview night. Right. Ah, okay. So they did it on the top of the Peterson Automotive Museum here in LA, which is super cool, especially because I live a couple blocks away and could walk over. And I was invited by uh, a friend of mine who's a journalist. And uh, basically, they had a rooftop event 
where they have food and drinks and all that stuff. And it's basically just to show off some of the things. Now, for context, so that was on the Monday. Then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday were going to be different auctions, okay? But it wasn't just all Anthony Daniels. Anthony Daniels was sort of the main event of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the auction were one, the other sort of other headliner was Vic Armstrong, who's Harrison Ford's long-term stunt guy. He's uh, he's done a million movies from James Bond to Superman, et cetera. He's a real legend in the business. Um, you know, again, also a guy up there in age who's lived a great life and has a lot of cool stuff. And so he was the other sort of main event thing in the auction, and the rest was just random memorabilia, right? And they sort of gathered. So in the middle of this rooftop, they had like a, a like a like a like a, a room that you could go in. It had a stage. Uh, it was very tight. It was very 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 tight. And but in the room were the props, uh, show off, and subsequently you know a bunch of seats and and all this stuff. And what this was was just sort of a preview night to show all this stuff up. And get people excited about it so you can see some of the props in person. And and then they did sort of two Q&As. One was Vic Armstrong uh, and his wife. And then the other was Anthony Daniels. I'll get into that in a minute. But, like, the movie memorabilia stuff was, like, all kinds of crazy shit, right? So it wasn't just Star Wars stuff. And I, I know I sent you guys a bunch of pictures, like, like from the Anthony Daniels stuff. It was, like, the original script for the first two movies and the 3PO head from Return of the Jedi, and, you know, his uh, director's chair from Force Awakens and just tons of stuff. But then there was other cool stuff. Like if you're a Trekkie, they had um, Spock's original costume on Vulcan from the motion picture mm. and uh, some key art, like painted key art from one of the teaser posters from Search for Spock. And then they had a bunch of Batman stuff. They had... I saw the Keaton uh, head, Keaton. the Keaton mask. Yeah, yeah that I was cool. That too. So they had they had Keaton's cow that was from '89, but then they had a Batarang I think from Batman and Robin, mm. and then they had his gloves from Batman Forever. But then the other thing was I don't know if I said this because it's hard to get a picture of it. They had Nicholson's gloves from '89. Oh was wow, signed by the him. purple gloves, awesome. Yeah, and then they had. Uh, Blade, uh, Blade Runner prop spinner, some of the matte paintings that they used in the backgrounds in Blade Runner. Um, they had, I mean, they had everything. Lucy Ricardo, Lucy Balls dresses, and Audrey Hepburn's dresses from Sabrina. I tell you, there's something really obscure here. I'm looking at Tote's glasses from Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that that's a and deep the cut. Staff, the head of the staff <laughs> of Raw. Yeah, and the head of the staff uh, of Raw. And then Vic Armstrong had his indie jacket and shirt from Temple of Doom. Oh, um, cool. You could, by the way, um, for, if, if you're a Seinfeld fan, they had Seinfeld's puffy pirate shirt <laughs> for auction. Like, I'm not, not joking, shirt. right? <laughs> All this crazy shit. And, you know, the the ability to just see these things was, was awesome. So, anyway, they did a Q&A with Vic Armstrong, which was great and sort of talked about what he was selling. And then they took a break, and then they had Anthony Daniels come up. And, you know, I've never seen Anthony Daniels like at Celebration or anything like that, but I imagine it was very similar to this. He's running through the crowd. And when I say the crowd, <laughs> it's only like 75 people, right? Yeah. And and all this stuff, right? And, um, uh, you know, and he's really interactive, and he's, you know, sort of very funny and, you know, it's a performance. Like the guy, you know, like the guy has genuine appreciation for um, what um, this, you know, life has given him, what Sergio right. has given him in this life. Um, you know, and he seems to genuinely enjoy it. And I, I said to him, you know, is this afterwards? I said, is this, that sort of like the show you do at Celebration? He's like, oh no, 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 this is this is more riffing and more fun. Celebration is a whole <laughs> thing. And um, they put too many you know, shackles you know, on him at Celebration. <laughs> yeah, this is this is more like 
Um, and, and the fun part was, you know, he'd take the occasional dig at George, you know, like the fun, like, you, you know, the, the usual, you don't know how to write this shit kind of thing. Right, and right, then, right, right. And, and, and took a slide dig at the sequels also, but, you know, and then sort of, mm. well, go, I'm the only human being on, on earth who can brag that was in all nine Star Wars movies. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, who can argue with that? And beyond, like he was sort of, and he won the crown and like. He did his own Q and A. Like he'd go into the crowd and like <laughs> someone raised a hand, he'd run to them and put the microphone in front of them. And some of the questions were really good. You know, some of the questions were about, you know, what it was like. How, how did you sort of perfect the walk and the costume, mm-hmm. uh, all that stuff? And he was basically like, he was all out of necessity. And he'd tell like these funny stories. Like George didn't care, you know, <laughs> the costume was on, and you know they're talking about how the costume would fall apart and all that shit when they were in Tunisia and all that stuff. Um, and then the cool part was at a certain point. He introduces Howard Kazanjian, who's uh, in the crowd for this. And I, I, I have to imagine maybe some of the memorabilia is his. Mm. Uh, maybe he's donated some stuff to it. I don't know. That's just me speculating. Um, and everybody's really excited, like that he was there and stuff like that. So, you know, and look, at these things, it's a bunch of rich nerds who are going to spend <laughs> a lot of money on these things. And so. Hey, for some know, of our younger, just, some of our younger listeners, can you tell us why uh, Howard Kazanjian was such a such a trip to meet and talk to. Well, because I, um, 20 years ago, I worked with him when he was on the board of an animation company. So I met him when I just started the business. So, and he was really, really nice to me when I was a kid, especially when I'm probably asking annoying questions, <laughs> but he would tell me all the behind the scenes stuff. A lot of stuff's out now, but like he was the one 20 years ago was telling me the stories about, Harrison Ford on Return of the Jedi being pissed off he didn't get killed off and all that <laughs> stuff. Like, he was the first person to tell me all that stuff where everybody thought, oh, you're making that shit up. And then eventually it all sort of came out. That it was true. Um, and it was just really, really nice. And again, I hadn't seen him in decades, right? So, um, you know, and Howard and, came and, on, uh, he, Howard came on as a producer about halfway through Empire Strikes Back, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and then he I took over so, fully yeah. for Gary Kurtz in Return of the Jedi. In Return yeah. of the Jedi. Yeah, there was concern and, uh, that Gary was allowing Kirsch to run away with the budget and he wasn't bringing in the – just wasn't following the schedule or keeping the the, the, the shoot right. on schedule. Right, right, right. And so, um, you know, so Anthony Daniels does his half-hour thing. Um, and then thanks to the person who brought me, who knew people involved with the auction, we got to – right after just sort of go to the green room to say hello and we said hello to him and his uh, anthony and his wife and you know we were chatting you know you're gonna go to tokyo for celebration he's like i don't know i'm old and, blah, blah. <laughs> and he sort of winks at you and you know he's sort of yeah he's yeah. you know he's he, he's he's got a lot of energy to it you know for, for for a guy's age and you know just casual chit chat and he signed the program books for me and all that stuff and and it was you know like a three four minute interaction and just chit chat and then i uh, i approached his agent because he, there's no way 20 years later he's going to recognize me without hair down on my shoulders and all this gray and all mm-hmm. that, you know all that shit and his wife seemed very impressed that i was telling him that i he was nice to me back in the day and you know, sort of impl- implying he wasn't always the nicest but he was very sweet <laughs> to me and no one ever says and that about that, him. <laughs> luckily, that photo, you know, my friend took that photo. I didn't know he took it. And I didn't want to be presumptuous and sort of, you know, ask for a photo and yeah. all that shit. So I'm glad I got it. And, you know, that I could brag to all my friends and and come on here and talk about it. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's just wild, you know, to see these things that are so important to us growing up that we've seen on screen. And it's like, you know, that C-3PO helmet looks like it's going to fucking fall up. Well, me, it's going to fall apart <laughs> any second and it sells for $840,000. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, uh, you know, that was like I'm a, always was a, amazed. Was a, you know, the first time I was ever able to see these props was the magic of myth tour from back right. in the early two thousands. Uh, at least that's when I saw it. And um, it was, it was such a, such a kick to see them but then you would look close and you'd be like huh 
that really does look like just some sort of thing they grabbed from a, you know, a drug store and painted and stuck on this leather belt that's now all fraying. And, you know, so there is there is that reality, too. I was looking at the Keaton mask and it's like, oh, you can see the latex, how it's kind of rough under the nose and not totally perfect. And but on screen, you know, it's magic. I mean, that's why they call it Hollywood There's magic. There's a charm to it. Yeah, there's a yeah. charm to it to see it that way. Like it, it's sort of the the you know to see you know I remember look there's two exhibits that I distinctly remember. One was when did they do this is a while ago, right? When did they do the costume tour after Revenge of the Sith? They did that big costume book. You know, the costumes of Star Wars. Oh, that's and, right. To promote that, all that stuff, and like, mm -hmm. and you know, then those things are very well taken care of, so it's very, very different. And then, I, my, my favorite thing that I ever went to of this kind, and I don't know if we ever talked about it, was I just happened to be in Japan right after Revenge of the Sith, and Lucas had an exhibit called The Art of Star Wars. That was the only exhibit at the time that were all, all six movies together. And he only did it because he loved Japan so much. He had an affinity for Japan. And I got to go to it. I have a great Japanese art of Star Wars book with tons of shit that's never been seen anywhere else. Uh, it's sort of like my one of my most prized possession kind of things. And they literally had like everything from every like Death Star model. It was all like Lucas's personal stuff. So this is going to be like 2005, 2006. And uh, they even had like um, uh, Anakin and Obi Wan in the in the ship that they uh, race in to track down Zam Wessel and mm -hmm. the Attack of the Clones and right. that stuff. Like, and that was the first time that shit had been seen anywhere. You know, like yeah, the speeder and 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 like it had crazy stuff. That, like that he specifically chose that had never been sort of shown to the public. So, you know, and again, but Lucas preserved those things really well. So you see them and they're shiny and they're cool. And well, you right. Know, to your point about the props, like when you see the props, it's like some of this may have been sitting in somebody's, you know, office or garage for. Oh, Anthony Daniel said that some of the, he was pulling this stuff out of cupboards and drawers and, you know, around his around his house. So over the years, he yeah. just stuffed a lot of well, this stuff the away. Thing is those actors get get all the merchandise sent to them. Well, yeah, they get the merch, uh, but what I don't understand is how Anthony Daniels walks home from the production of Return of the Jedi with a fully functional C-3PO head. I mean, you, you said it yourself, George Lucas put a real priority on preserving the items from his films, and we know this because, like you, we've seen those museum exhibits, but yet... Here's a C-3PO head that sold last week for $850,000, and it was just something Anthony Daniels lugged home with him after work one day. I, I just, you know, for the original Star Wars film, I understand it, because nobody knew it was going to be such a super mega hit, but by the time Return of the Jedi rolled around... There was a price tag on all things Star Wars. So how does that happen right. where actors just help themselves to <laughs> props and wardrobe and it ends up in their homes? Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, it, it, it's just fun to be close to that thing. And I was very lucky to be invited to it and spend some time. How upset is the family with you because you drained the bank account eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> for that C three PO head? Look, Let's just admit it's you know, everyone. That was the fun part of the preview night is like there, there's no temptation there. All right, well, let me ask you a question: If you could have left that preview event with one item, any item, just one, and we're not going to hold it against you that much if it's not a star wars item what would, but seriously if you were able to walk away with just one item what would it have been that's a good question it's there's a couple no i said one <laughs> then I'm gonna go what am i a genie <laughs> <laughs> there's I'm no three wishes with, <laughs> i'm gonna go with the script for empire strikes back Ooh. Uh, yeah. was it signed 
Was there were there notes in no. it? What uh, made it so special? Like, there was no cover on it. There was, there was in him. I thought I seen there's a picture of it. I think I might. Uh, I think this is a picture of it. This it was on the cover picture. The site is it. It sort of has That's like a, a a taupe uh, cover. This says Star Wars, but. No, yeah, I think that's no, from that's the, original the original film. movie, Star Wars one. Oh, so we had no, a script for the original too? It's 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 I'm looking at it now. It's draft two twenty seventy nine. I'm sending it to you guys now. All right. Uh, and it's uh, it's literally page two. It starts exterior plane of hot, Luke's point of view, we follow a bright object oh, as it falls it. to the ground. And it's literally like the Tauntaun reaction. And you can tell it's different dialogue. You can tell they sort of ended up like putting their own spin on it. It's sort of the same thing, but like they sort of naturally deliver it. Um, but yeah, that's, that was the thing. I All right. I got it up here right excited. now. Okay, here we go. There it that's is. It. Ex yeah. Exterior plane of Hoth. Luke's POV day from Luke's POV. We follow a bright object as it falls to the ground. Did yeah. you uh, happen to come across this really oddball item that was available in the auction? It was a gingerbread cookie that was <laughs> given to Anthony on the last day of shooting <laughs> The Last Jedi by Kathy Kennedy. Here's what Daniel said about it, uh, according to Hollywood Reporter. I passed Mark Hamill on his last day, and he said, I've been in all of these movies, and what am I getting as a leaving present? A cookie. And I kind of laughed, and then the same thing happened to me. I got a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got it. Is this the cookie? Is that it? Yeah, I'm sure it is. I think this is. is the cookie because it says Jolly Ginger. Do you think Kathy a... made this herself in her Easy Bake Oven? <laughs> it looks like a five-year-old did. I mean, I, Parker could have made this. <laughs> There's so many comments I can make right now that I refuse to. <laughs> No, I'm gonna just behave myself. Have a cookie, <laughs> AD. <laughs> I'm just. Oh man, I'm just gonna behave myself. Just gonna behave myself. <laughs> well, All let's right. put an end to that and let's hear your what review you for the acolyte. I want yeah, to hear we what went you think of the it. trailer. Yeah, after yeah, we went through it earlier, um, want to get your thoughts? Um, it's fine. I thought it was a little flat. And what I'm sort of annoyed by is thanks to somebody I know, I was able to see like a really good copy of the celebration footage from the show, mm -hmm. which has some of this in it. And that was better than what the trailer is. So I don't know if they're holding stuff back. Hmm. Um, look, I give them credit. They're taking a shot at new characters, new stuff. Uh, Etc. Jedi, you know. I, look, I'm, I'm the first thing that you guys know this. I, I haven't read the High Republic stuff. I'm not fluent in it by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but again, you know, my casual Star Wars fans always complain that they just go back to the well too many times with Obi Wan and the Skywalkers and blah blah blah. Like, where's the new stuff? Well, here's the new stuff. So, you know, I'm hoping it works for that reason. Um. You know, it feels very prequely. Um, you know, it, it, like everything, it's wait and see. Like, look, it's a martial arts inspired Star Wars show, which for me is like the dream come true. So, you know, it's like, you know, that's what I want. And Carrie Ann Moss is cool as hell. Um, so, it, it, again, it just boils down to like everything. It's like, first of all, I mean, I don't think they know how to market anything anymore anyway. But the and, and that's not exclusive to Disney and Lucasfilm. I just think people are just so. What, what, what's the Twitter audience going to think? What's the regular audience going to think? What's the poem? You know, just go make a good show. And, and I think, by the way, from what I'm constantly told about the show and the premise and the approach to it, it's like, hey, that's really cool. And we haven't seen this kind of thing. And putting that with the Jedi is really interesting. And I think I think there's some curveballs coming that we we won't expect. Um, we might see a familiar character or two. And th again, that's not based on any knowledge. That's speculation. Um, so I, I just, again, like everything, it's just wait and see. But I thought the trailer was a little 
you know, had hints of interesting things, but was presented in a way that I thought was a little flat. I think it needed a little more sift to it to get yeah. people excited about it. But again, we've got what five months, four months, whatever it is. No, it's we're, June. Oh, it's two months. Yeah. So it's, yeah it's two you know, two months to to milk it a little bit it, more. Yeah, no, because I mean I'm sure know, May fourth we'll get we'll session. probably get a big trailer. Did they call I can't remember if they called this a teaser or not. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna I, do I believe they are the, referred to it's a menace as release, right? Phantom Menace release will this? have footage, fresh footage from Acolyte tacked onto it, whether it be you know a I'm new trailer or... Fourth. Did I tell you guys this? I think I told you guys this. Um, the Advantage of Living Where I Live, the Academy Museum is down the block, and they're showing Rogue One and Return of the Jedi on May the 4th at the Academy Museum, which is a beautiful theater. Oh, cool. um, and I got the tickets for I got the tickets for Return of the Jedi, cool. um, which I can't remember the last time I saw any of those movies on the big screen. So that's going to be super cool. Yeah, especially that'll be great. after meeting Howard Kazanji again and <laughs> and seeing the C three PO helmet and uh, all that stuff. But you know, uh, there, there's a rumor, by the way. Did you guys hear this? Or maybe I'm just not paying attention. That on May the fourth, they're going to do some selected marathons of all nine movies. Yes, that is going to happen. As a matter of fact, star Wars.com just uh, announced it this week that, uh, yeah, at certain theaters will be uh, having star Wars marathons of all nine films. Well, I'll tell you what, I couldn't sit yeah. in a theater for all nine films. No way. I'll sit at home and do I it any time. <laughs> in a theater, forget about I usually about go to the New Beverly for the double features of like the old Jackie Chan movies and I'll fall asleep. So, nine movies, forget it. I sat through the original trilogy once, uh, back for, before the prequels even came out. It was a, a old old theater. Like, uh, it wasn't a movie theater. It was a theater theater. And... Um, it was great. It was fun. I was glad I did it. They did an intermission in between each film for about 20 minutes and it was an experience. Um, but it, you know, it was a long time. It was a long time sitting there. Me, I, me, that's, that's three let movies, let alone nine. Let me ask you this. Are they going to show it in chronological order? I'm sure it will be one start, through nine. Is it gonna be four? I'm sure it'll be one no, through nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm positive. I, mean, it's fine. I don't care. Like I'm not, you know, yes, me, it will a be prequel guy. So I, I've confirmed it that all nine episodic films will be shown in chronological order. So chronological from the Phantom Menace order. to the rise of Skywalker. Yeah. And uh, like I said, the uh, Phantom Menace re-release will have an exclusive look at the acolyte tacked on to it probably right before it starts. Tickets are on sale now as this podcast goes live. So and they don't have a list of markets, though, that I can no, see. I'm not, yeah, I'm not seeing that either, but I'm sure all that information is out there. People, if they want to do it, they, sh they should track it down. We will be busy in Bristol, Connecticut on May the 4th, hosting RFR Live in the 700-seat Rockwell Theater in downtown Bristol, Connecticut. And uh, right why after we you, do... Why are you going to Connecticut? They invited us. They asked us, yeah. They said, <laughs> no hey, shit. come on out. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, well, so we'll be doing... fly guests out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I just you never heard that you already had plans. <laughs> you don't, I'll skip that to fight Blake on stage. Wouldn't that be great? That? And here's the, here's, here's the, the kicker. The lightsaber fight. You can see Empire Strikes Back on the big screen. We're we're, we're the opening act for Empire. How's yeah. that? Oh shit! I'd prefer that than Return of the Jedi. <laughs> well, hey you man, guys and then the movie. It, it was, was cool. It was great catching up with you, and really appreciate the uh, first person recounting of your time at the uh, prop store auction. I'm glad you got to reacquaint yourself with your old buddy Howard Kazanjian, your old boss. <laughs> And then it's a, it's a, it's crazy that this was the first time you'd ever seen Anthony Daniels live doing his his thing. Yeah, yeah. no, he's but, a blast. He's a blast. Thanks, thanks for having me. We'll be. I'm sure we'll be back for. 
oh. possibly lose their acolyte edition. I think once we get that final, you know, that 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 official trailer, we should definitely have you back and we'll do a little profit or loser fun about that yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. You know how to find me. I'm <laughs> tricky to land, but I eventually show up. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks again. Appreciate it. Best to everybody. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Later, Take FJ. Care, FJ. Chewy, get us out of here! I am programmed in etiquette and protocol. I also am programmed with great knowledge. That is why I think Jason Swank is a little weenie. Well, I was going to wrap things up for us this week here on Rebel Force Radio. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, tuning in, taking us on your commute, hanging with us while you're doing the laundry. I listen to podcasts a lot of times while I'm flipping laundry. Whatever it is you're doing, we're there for you. And get those earbuds in. Great to be hanging with you all. If you'd like to be hanging with us, you can do so. In Bristol, Connecticut, coming up May the 4th weekend. It's going to be a happening. Jimmy Mack has the details, and those details can also be found on the Rebel Force Radio website. So you want me to fill in the blanks now, huh? (laughs) Uh, I thought you could do this in your sleep. (laughs) Well, you know, I, I did mention to FJ just a few minutes ago that we are going to be appearing on May the 3rd, or I'm sorry, May the 4th, <laughs> yikes, May the 4th be with you, hello, <laughs> we'll be appearing May the 4th, 2024 in Bristol, Connecticut at the Rockwell Theater, they're having a big day of uh, events, Star Wars events, lightsaber training and performances, Padawan training, artists and comics and food trucks and vendors and live podcasts from RFR. We're going to be doing a full show in the beautiful Rockwell Theater. And then we're going to uh, have a little meet and greet in their art gallery. And then Empire Strikes Back is going to be screened on the big screen. And we're going to hang out for the whole thing. And then afterwards, we're going to have an after party. Details on that coming soon. The tickets are $18 to get in. And that includes the full day of events, including the film. And the podcast. So uh, we want to see everyone there who can be there May 4th, 2024, uh, 3 to 10 p.m. in Bristol, Connecticut. RFR will be hitting the stage at 4 o'clock, and it'll be a lot of fun. And we can't wait to see you all there. It's going to be great. Check it out. All the details at rebelforceradio.com. If you need more Rebel Force Radio in your life, the best way to do it is to go to rebelforceradio.com and click on that Patreon banner. Click on the Patreon banner where you'll be taken to sign up at the level of your choice. Over on Patreon, you'll get all kinds of great benefits, including the weekly full show videos, the podcast you're listening to right now that's available for you, plus exclusive podcasts that you can't get anywhere else. And you get to hang out with one of the best Star Wars communities you can find on the World Wide Web. And if you've been listening to our after shows, we always put our patreon supporters at the head of the queue as they're calling in so you get to hear their voices and get to know them and they're just as awesome in real life as they are on the after show so check that out rebel force radio on patreon patreon.com slash rebel force radio please check us out on youtube we've been releasing uh video highlights of the full show video that you can get in little small snippets uh would love to have you to check those out and uh like them and leave a comment and that just helps out all the little uh, all the little algorithms there on YouTube and gets more people exposed to Rebel Force Radio. We appreciate that. That's Rebel Force Radio on YouTube. So please subscribe, like, comment today. Follow us on our socials, Facebook, X, Instagram. We're there. And the official website, as I said, for all things and everything Rebel Force Radio, rebelforceradio.com. But if you want to help us out, the best thing is and always will be just to do what you're doing now. Keep listening. Keep referring your friends to Rebel Force Radio. It's amazing after 11 years of this podcast and six years of the previous podcast that it just keeps growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but And we know that that's because of you all evangelizing and telling folks about it. So if you love RFR, tell your friends about it, the Star Wars fans in your life. 
If you can, subscribe with your podcatcher of choice. And if it offers you the opportunity, leave a review. Just one simple rule, please. Make them good. And we will see you next time here on Rebel Force Radio. Don't forget, Bad Batch After Show next week, Wednesday, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And then the RFR weekly podcast drops on Saturdays while there is a new Star Wars show on Disney+. Plus. That's the schedule. Until then, we'll see you next time. For Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mang. And remember, the Force will be with you always. Sacri